Good afternoon. It's a real pleasure for me to be here and to deliver the Rutland Lecture. So the family, thank you first of all. Where, where is David? Thank you so much. What a fabulous notion. I wish every seminary would have this sort of a lecture series because the work is simply so important. I also want to thank folks at Luther Seminary, uh, Jody who is taking care of every need, which is just, <laughs> it's just magnificent. And then to, to catch up with Alan, Alan wrote over a year ago and said, would you come to Minneapolis in January? <laughs> And I said, what could be better than to be with Lutherans in Minnesota in January? Uh, it really is a pleasure to be here. We met for the first time in the summer of 1996, and it was one of the best summers of my life. Don't be telling about this now. Yeah, so I can make up stuff. So the topic is food and eating. And what I'd like to do this afternoon with you is help you expand your imagination for what eating is because I think it's very important for us to do so. You know, Alan said, I didn't know that I needed a theology of eating. And that's typical, Alan, to say. But uh, what you discover is that eating is one of the most intimate ways we have for living with each other. Eating is one of those things that we do several times a day, sometimes more, sometimes less. It's absolutely essential that we do it. It's the means of life, but we don't take a lot of time to think about it. It's one of those common mundane actions that we can easily take for granted, especially in this particular time in the history of humanity. Because if you're like me, Almost all the food you eat is food that you have simply purchased, right? So our relationship to food is a shopping relationship. And what you need to understand is, first of all, this is utterly new in the history of humanity. And it's also created the conditions in which we have, as a result, become the most superficial eaters the world has ever known. And I, I don't mean that to blast you, because I'm with you. I used to farm in Western Canada and thought I was going to be a farmer, but I was coming into adulthood in the 1980s. And it was the absolute worst time to think about getting into farming, because we had a farm and it was a mixed operation of cattle, chicken, pigs, grain operation, all sorts of things. And the bankers were very clear, if you're going to keep farming, you have to get really, really big. And I had some high school friends who decided to do that, and, and they're big-time operators, where they're, you know, employing 20 to 30 farm workers, feedlots of 20 to 50,000 head of cattle, and massive loads of debt. And I didn't want to do that, so I went to university and ended up studying philosophy, of all things. French and German philosophy. And farmers never show up there. <laughs> but that all changed when I met Wendell Berry when I started teaching in Kentucky. And what Wendell gave me was the great gift of self-integration. He said, Norman, think about your agricultural roots and start to do philosophy and theology in a way that honors the farming culture you grew up in. And it's been the best gift in the world to me because I now see the philosophy that interested me and the theology that interests me now that when we understand it in an agrarian way, it changes everything. So I want to talk with you a little bit about what something like an agrarian way of thinking about faith, an agrarian way of thinking about church life and church ministry how this might be a game changer and maybe a world healer, a community healer, because if you're paying attention, you know we need it desperately. One of the things about eating, which is so fabulous, is that it is one of those actions that positions us in the world. Because as you know, for you to eat, 
you have to be in relationship because eating is one of the most intimate actions that we as human beings perform. Maybe even more intimate than sex. Did you wake up? <laughs> Now why? Think about it. Every time you take a bite, you take the flesh of another living being into your body. You incorporate the flesh of fellow creatures to live. That's terrifying. But it's been made less terrifying for us because as shoppers of food, we don't think about it as the flesh of other living creatures. You go into a store and everything that you see is perfect. Vegetables, they don't have dirt on it, right? When's the last time you purchased meat that had fur or feather or even a bone? We want our food to be stripped of all the vestiges of its life. And so we package it, we stylize it, we rearrange it, we process it, we do all sorts of things so that we can be convinced that the food we eat is just, it's just stuff. And as a result, we don't understand or fully appreciate how the living that we do through the eating that we do depends upon the consumption of the flesh of other creatures, plant and animal flesh. And I know sometimes we want to say, well, if you're a meat eater, that's when you got all the problems. And if you're a vegetarian, you're sort of off the hook. And I want to say we need to reevaluate that because if you hang out with botanists like I like to do, you discover that plants are far more interesting than we've given them credit for. That these are also living beings with circulatory systems. They don't have what we might call a brain stem or a nervous system like human beings or land animals do. But plants are constantly in communication with each other. They're constantly in communication with soil. So for instance, if you take one single rye plant in four months, one seed in good soil will send out roots into the ground that exceed 700 miles. And if you add the hairs that attach to the roots, it's 3,000 miles. This is a plant that's desperate for communication. It's not a communication with words. It's a chemical conversation. It's a plant wanting to attach, to be in relationship. And as botanists are finally realizing that all the real action in a plant is underground, the soil is where it's at, folks. It truly is. So. When you go to Genesis 2 and you come into that garden and you see God on God's knees holding soil into, into his mouth because God is kissing the soil, breathing into the soil the life that is you and me, the plants and the animals. God loves soil because soil is the matrix of life. Farmers know this. We don't. We don't want any vestiges of soil in our food stores. But the soil is absolutely central in the first creation story. And so we need to attend to the fact that when we don't pay attention to the soil, we lose one of the first, most fundamental, primary ways in which we come into contact with God. Because soil is the medium through which the breath of life is constantly moving so as to produce the food that you and I need to eat. We might look at the, the creation story in, in Genesis 2 and say that's kind of a poetic. Someone in the humanities might write something like that. But if you talk to scientists, they'll tell you that actually this is a pretty good description of what our bodies are like. So that the microbiome that is in our guts mirrors very, very closely the microbiome that's in the soil. 
And so to have an unhealthy soil is to also have an unhealthy humanity. So once we get over our prejudice against plants, we might realize that even when we eat just a vegetarian diet, we're constantly entering into processes of life and death that exceed our comprehension. And so for us to live, we need to consume the gift of another's life. And the question, the big, big question is, how do we make ourselves worthy of the gift of another's life? Okay? We don't need to think about that very much, and I think this has been a huge, huge mistake. Because when we take our food for granted, when we just think that because we live in the culture where we do and food seems to be so plentiful, right? When's the last time you walked into a grocery store and it wasn't packed? We think the food will always be there. And I know there are lots of people in the world today who still worry about whether the food will be there, even in this country. And so we have to ask the question, has our sort of taking for granted the food always being their position, has it made us forget who we are? Has it made us forget where we are? Has it made us forget our need? If you don't eat, you know that you have not eaten. And it sticks in you in such a way as to confirm in a way that no head knowledge ever will that without the life of others, you have no life. Right? These are not abstractions. And this is why food and eating, I think, are such wonderful entries into life's big questions. Where are we? What are we supposed to do? So that when theologians say to me, what do you mean you have to do a theology of eating? Alan's just not one. I mean, so many people when I was writing the book said, don't you have anything more important to think about? <laughs> Seriously. And I wanted to say, but what's more important to think about than the very means of our own life? As I said, we are in this new position where we are primarily the shoppers of food, and so the way we think about our eating has fundamentally changed. So let's just think a little bit about how people in the past might have related to food. Let's start with the group of folk that have been around the longest, hunter-gatherers. As you probably know, there aren't many hunter-gatherers left in the world today, but as anthropologists have still tried to study those people who live this very mode of life, one of the things they discover is that these are people who have developed a kind of attunement to their place which absolutely boggles the mind. So for instance, as someone who's a hunter-gatherer, you have to know exactly where the plants are you have to know when they produce their fruit because you have to be there at exactly the right time because when the fruit appears, you're not the only creature that wants to eat it. <laughs> so if you snooze, you lose. And when you lose, you starve. And when you starve, you're dead. So this is knowledge you better learn. And of course, it's a very complex, wide-ranging knowledge because you don't just have fruit from one plant that you have to know about. You have to know all the plants. And then think if you're going to be hunting an animal. What do you have to know about the, the animal? We don't have high-powered rifles, right? Sometimes these animals were caught not by any implement. They were simply run down. So human beings outran these deer. The deer would get exhausted, and then finally they would just collapse, and that's when the hunters could capture them to eat them. And they talk about how the hunter, before they could hunt an animal, had to go through a moral purification process so that they would not be the corrupt ones who could simply presume on the life of another, because if they presumed on the life of another, they say uniformly that the animal would not give itself to them. And so there's a kind of sympathetic attunement 
that goes on between hunter and prey. And when they talk to some of these hunters, they say really fascinating things like, I have to imagine being that animal. What would the animal do when it sees a hunter coming? I have to anticipate. How many of you feel you need to have that kind of attunement to animals? One of the biblical stories that we could open up if we had more time would be the story of Noah and the ark. One of the things I love about that story is that Noah had to have a sympathetic love for the animals because A, Noah had to know what are the animals that have to get on the ark and then B, Noah had to take care of the animals while they're on the ark means he's got to know what the animals eat. He needs to know what the animals need to be healthy. And so one of the rabbinic traditions says that Noah was righteous because like God, he was curious about all the life on the ark. And not incidentally, I think, Noah emerges from the ark described by God as a man of the soil. He made the lives of others the most important thing for him to know. Because only as he understood the lives of others was he in the, in the real position of being the one who could live properly with them. Now let's think about agricultural people. What do agricultural people need to know to grow food? I know there are lots of caricatures of farmers, of farmers being simpletons or rednecks. There's all sorts of derogatory terms that people have used. Marx referred to the idiocy of rural life. And I've often wondered about that because the people that I grew up farming with, they didn't seem to me to be ignorant at all. In fact, I look at some of my peers and I think, well, there's a lot of ignorance going on right here. All we've managed to be able to do is learn how to click a few buttons because most of us now experience the world through screens, right? And the, even the shopping that we do for food has been made so easy because you can be in your pajamas on a couch and just scroll through all the beautifully formatted pictures of the food you want and you hit the submit button and the food shows up at your door. Sometimes it even comes with the recipes and all the packaging. You know, eventually I'm told they're going to put it in the fridge for you and then eventually they're going to cook it for you and eventually they'll put it in your mouth for you. What will be left for us to do? What will be left for us to have to know? So we can be naive, we can be ignorant, we can be belligerent, we can be whatever, and the food's there. But not so for farmers. Their reality is fundamentally different because they have to know what do plants need. They have to know what does soil need because soil, folks, is a miracle. What other entity in this whole of planet Earth do you know that absorbs the death of plant and animal life and transforms it into the possibility for fertility? Walt Whitman said once, we should be overcome by the stench of death. But we're not. Because the soil is the first site of hospitality. Soil welcomes death. Think about that. Soil welcomes death and in processes of decomposition, transformation, regeneration, the hope for new life appears. Hans Jenny, one of the great soil scientists of the last century, said, after studying soil for 70 years, I don't know what soil is. Because it's impossible to know where the biotic and the abiotic end. Is it an organism? I don't know. It acts like one, but it doesn't seem to be one. If we didn't have soil, we couldn't survive. 
And it's not just that the soil is there as a container that we put our seeds in and stuff grows. No, the seed is a matrix. It's a womb that cradles death. Think about that. It takes in death and refuse, what we don't want. And in this act of hospitality, welcomes it so that new life can emerge. Farmers are paying attention to this, which is why every good gardener, every good farmer knows the first question you ask yourself is, what's the quality of the land? And the farmers that I grew up with, their point was not to grow as much food as possible. Their objective was to make the farm better than when they got it so that it could be passed on to the next generation more fertile than when they first got it. And as you know, the processes of industrial production make that extremely difficult because rather than seeing the soil as something that we husband, something that we nurture, that we exercise our own forms of hospitality with, we've decided that the way to work with soil is to mine it. My friend Wes Jackson says once, we treat the soil as if it were in the ICU. We hammer it with poisons, that's a fancy term for some medicines, and then we put it on life support, and the life support synthetic fertilizer. Is this a way to treat the medium that God kisses to make life possible? Now I say I grew up farming, and so I should know this stuff. So let me tell you a story about how quickly we can forget. When I was living in Kentucky, we had just the two girls at that point, and we bought our first house. And I said, I'm a farm boy. I'm having a garden. So I, with my daughters, this is so cute, people. With my daughters, we go decide, and we're going to build an 8 by 8 plot. We turn over the soil, we add compost, we're super excited, we're getting our strawberry plants because I think what could be more fun than for my daughters and I to grow strawberries together? And we'll go out there and we'll water them and we'll watch the berries emerge and sure enough, you know, after a few weeks, the green berries come and they're getting bigger and my kids are getting excited and then they start to turn pink and they start to turn reddish and I say, Emily Nana, in two days they'll be ready. You're laughing. You know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> so two days later, we get up and we go outside, and guess what's happened? Well, they're not totally gone, but mostly gone. Why? Nope. Ants and slugs. All right, so you can imagine this is major defeat for Dad. <laughs> My girls are super excited. We're going to go get strawberries. We even got some vanilla ice cream to eat them with. <laughs> and I go out there, you know, proud. Look what we did. Look what I did. And we get out there, and we see the slugs are eating the strawberries and the ants. And there are pieces of red on these vines. And my girls are just devastated. I'm furious. <laughs> So, like any self-respecting male, I went to Walmart. <laughs> you know why? Because they have pest management solutions. Come in the form of those green bottles. They're really handy. But in very unmanlike fashion, I read the directions. And they said, in effect, don't let children or pets near the area you spray and burn all clothing that comes into contact with it. I read that and I said, hmm, I'm going to spray this on my strawberries and then in a few days when the next round of berries is around, I'm going to eat them? Seriously? So I didn't use the solution. I did the next best thing. I called my mom. <laughs> I said, Mom, 
The ants and the slugs ate my berries. What should I do? And she said, well, simple. Didn't you know? <laughs> no. She says, well, take a mayonnaise jar lid, put beer in it. The slug will crawl right in and die. And if you're a slug, there isn't a better way to go. <laughs> right? I know some people who might think that's a good way to go. Yeah. And she said, the, with the, the, the ants, it's not a problem. Just get some vinegar with some water, mix it up, and spray it on your plants. The ants hate vinegar, and it won't hurt your strawberries a bit. Thanks, Mom. Now, that's just a little example about what you need to know just to grow strawberries. And that's just one slice of what we need to know about raising strawberries. How much do you need to know to raise a whole farm? The idea that farmers don't know things is so grossly unfair. Because farmers, gardeners, these are people who devote themselves to the care of the life in their charge, which is one of the reasons, I believe, that this creation story that we get in Genesis 2 presents God to us as a gardener. I grew up in a farming community, and I never once heard a sermon called God the Farmer or God the Gardener. And I want to know, what is it about us in churches that even now still resists the idea that God is presented as a gardener? And I say it's the first creation story. I know it comes second in the Bible, but, and, you know, one of my biblical colleagues tells me that it may not be the older anymore, so I have to fudge on this. But think about this. The Israelites are giving to themselves a description about who God is. And they didn't say, like they could have, that God is a warrior, that God creates through violence, or the fear of intimidation and reprisal. Instead, they say, God is a gardener, and that God gardens life to bring about fertility and fecundity. I grew up with the idea that God is mostly far away and really angry at us, and here you get a description about God as God is on God's knees, holding soil so close as to kiss it. This is a God who's intimate with us, with all flesh. So near, as Psalm 104 says, that if God were to turn God's face away, everything would collapse to the ground and die. So any of those notions that you might have about God being far, far away, forget them. Because God is a gardening God who delights in the creatures. That's why it's called paradise, the Garden of Eden. And this is the God that we then are invited to come alongside with so that we too might have that kind of intimate, knowledgeable, affectionate, sympathetic relationship with the whole realm of creation. Remember it says that this Adam formed out of the ground is then put in the garden to till and keep it? I heard that growing up as a passage saying, see, this is how humanity is punished. And I get that because in North Carolina where I live, if I go pick a tomato in August, I sweat just picking one tomato. And the ground is like a rock. And so the gardening work in August is really, really hard. And I've got wire grass. Sometimes they call it Bermuda grass. It's from the devil. Because <laughs> you can't get rid of it. So yeah, gardening is hard. Farming is really hard. But that's not the description of what gardening life is. When we are told to go into the garden and till and keep it, we're being asked to come with God into an intimate relationship with things, with places, with fellow creatures, so that we can better know their potential, so that we can understand their need, so that we can, like God, 
assume a gardening posture in which the care of each other, the production of food, the production of beauty, might be the end result. It's an amazing thing. So the food imagination that we want to try to create today, the eating imagination we want to create today, is one in which we come to a better understanding of our intimacy with the life of others. The shopping relationship, as I have already told you, is the one that creates distance. It's a world in which the food that is out there appears to us as a commodity. And this is really important to understand, folks. Because food appears to us as a commodity, the kinds of relationship we have follow a commodity logic. And a commodity logic works like this. If it's a product, I want to have it as easily, conveniently, and cheaply as possible. And if you know anything about how food systems work, you know that when we want food cheaply, conveniently, we're going to do a lot of damage to the world. And there's lots of ways that we could describe this. I'll just use one, chickens. Do you like to eat chicken? Lots of Americans do. But we don't want to pay a lot for the chicken. And so we have found ways to industrialize the bird. And that means we do genetic modification of the bird. We develop particular kinds of feed. We cram them into facilities where they can't move around. But it's okay because they couldn't move around much anyway because we like white meat, which means that we design birds that will grow really big breasts, but their bodies can't handle the stress of all that weight. And plus, we want to make sure that we can have as many rotations of chickens through our chicken houses, so instead of taking maybe 85 to 90 days to raise a chicken, we can do it in 50, all by using advanced feed formulations. From a commodity point of view, it makes perfect sense because the chicken is just a unit of production, right? Imagine if we did that with kids. I have four. They were all athletes. What if my wife and I had said, wait a minute, 18 years we're going to have to feed them. It's a long time. What if we come up with a special diet and we sort of cram them so that instead of being in the house 18 years, we'll do it in 10. Think of all the money we'll save. It would be a desecration. It would be a sign that we do not honor the life of the, of the child. But the desecration began long before in the desecration of the chicken. Because we have said in our industrial system that something like the integrity of a plant or an animal doesn't matter because we apply to the production of plants and animals a commodity logic. And that means it's all about efficiency, it's all about profitability, and I, I don't want to be heard to say that we shouldn't be interested in efficiency and certainly not that we shouldn't be interested in profitability. I am very much for farmers being able to make a living. And that would get us into farm policy, which we can talk about later if you'd like to. Because I think one of the most egregious things about our society is that we ask farmers to grow food and then have them work for a non-living wage. It's simply wrong. And not just the farmers, all the food service providers along the way. So if we are stuck in a world where there's a commodity logic being applied, what might be a different way to think about food? If it's not a commodity, what is it? And the answer that I've come up with is to say that food is God's love made delicious. <laughs> All right, now you're saying, okay, he's gone poetic on us, right? Food is God's love made nutritious, delicious, delectable. Now, why do I say that? Because from a theological point of view, you have to ask the question, why does God create a world at all? 
And if you've taken Dr. Paget's class, you know it's not because God has any need or deficiency. It's because God loves. It's the only reason we have for thinking about the creation of the world. In other words, God creates in the mode of hospitality. Right? And I want to use that language rather than just in the mode of love because love is kind of a mushy kind of word, right? <laughs> hospitality is serious. And John of Damascus, one of the great early church writers, actually spoke this way by saying that God, in the very first gesture of creation, creates by making room for another to be. Right? God makes room so that something other than God can be. But then God doesn't just leave stuff by itself, doesn't abandon what God has made room for. No, God becomes the host who welcomes the other into God's own life in the form of nurture. And the nurture of these creatures is for a very particular purpose, which is to liberate the creature into the fullness of its life. So, if you want to think about God's work of hospitality as an expression of love, what you need to think is, is that God makes room for others, then nurtures those others so that those others can be liberated into their lives. And we think this way because Scripture speaks this way all the time. Think about the prophets who speak for God, denouncing the society in which people go hungry. For any creature to be hungry is a direct affront to God because God is the one who provides. And we heard some talk already at this conference about how systems of injustice emerge in which land is consolidated, in which there's a hoarding of food that happens so some go hungry. We're supposed to become like Noah who, by making the ark the training ground, the site for hospitality, welcomes life, protects life, nurtures life so that when the trouble is over, they can emerge into the fullness of their life. And Jesus does the very same thing. If you look at the various ministries of Jesus, what you discover is this hospitality now enfleshed in the varying forms of ministry that Jesus performs. So that if there's a situation in which there's a person who's hungry, Jesus feeds them. If there's a situation in which someone is ill, right, Jesus heals them. If there's somebody lonely, Jesus befriends them. If someone is under the grip of an evil spirit, Jesus exercises them. Jesus comes into contact with the flesh of the world so that the flesh can be liberated into its own life. And one of the, I think, most powerful stories to make this clear is the story of the Gerasene demoniac. You'll remember this man. He lives near the tombs. He's in a graveyard, symbolizing that even though he's alive, he's really living a life of death. People have tried to chain him up, right? Think about that. When else have we unchained people? And this person is a threat to himself, a threat to everybody. This person is not living into the fullness of their lives. And so Jesus encounters this man and performs the action of liberation so that the spirit that was in him that was just destroying him, eating him up from the inside, goes into pigs. And I know people have wondered about the pigs. Why does Jesus do this? Does Jesus not like pigs? <laughs> and I've got a take on this, and Barbara, you can tell me if this is really out of touch, but we're told that the pigs numbered in the thousands. And these pigs, of course, when the spirits went into them, they went over the cliff and died. My hypothesis is that those were industrialized pigs. <laughs> because think about it. Jesus is the first critic of agribusiness. 
because nobody can take care of 2,000 pigs and do it well. Because first of all, if you've been around pigs, pigs are incredibly smart animals. They have a sympathetic nature about them which is uncannily human. And so to have had a conglomeration of 2,000 pigs, these were pigs that were not being loved the way they should be loved. So Barbara, you tell me later if that was just way out of line. All right. How did I get to that? So it's about hospitality. I want to expand the, the stuff about hospitality a bit now and bring it home to you. For a long time, we've been trained to think that, you know, we're not like plants, you know, that are stuck in the ground. We're even not like animals that even though they move around, they live instinctually. We are, we're the special ones because we're rational. And so we think of ourselves as self-standing and autonomous. We can choose life for ourselves. And we think about ourselves as these sort of self-contained units that can move around the world and appropriate the world for ourselves and do with it what we'd like. That whole conception is a fundamental delusion. And we're only beginning to learn about this because of what I mentioned just very much in passing earlier on, which is the, the idea that we are discovering microorganisms like we've never understood them before. So for instance, the picture of you as being one kind of thing is fundamentally flawed because you have hundreds of trillions of microorganisms, bacteria, in your body. Did you know that? Hundreds of trillions. The genetic material in your body, the ratio is 130 bacteria to you one. That means your body's not your own. Your body is a host to all the other life, microorganismic, that is inside of you. And that you don't even eat just for yourself. The eating that you do is for the microorganisms. Because if the microorganisms aren't happy, you ain't happy. <laughs> All right? So the thing that, if there's one thing you remember about today, it is you are a zoo. All right? Write that down. You are a zoo. And there are so many ways this has worked out. When a child is born and it nurses, for a long time, doctors wondered, you know, some of the milk that the mother gives doesn't seem to go to the child which is why children that don't nurse sometimes have trouble with their immune system, become more susceptible to inflammatory diseases. And what doctors eventually realized that, you know, the formulas that they were creating, because they would sort of try to pattern the formula on milk, is that the mother wasn't producing milk at first. What was the mother producing? Colostrum. So they started to figure out, what's, the, what's colostrum? And then they realized it's all for the microorganisms. Think about that. The first food that the mother gives its infant, it's not even for the baby. It's for the bugs. <laughs> That's love that only a mother has. I mean, you got to love your mama. She's thinking about you and the whole world that makes you possible. And what we've also learned is that one of the reasons vaginal birth is so important is that going through the vaginal canal, the fetus is just bathed in these microorganisms. So that we know that little kids that spend more time in barns have a better immune system because they're around microorganisms all the time. 
And the more we try to create a sterile world, the worse it is for us. Okay, so you can tell this is really cool and we could spend a lot of time here, but I don't want to do that. What I want us to focus on is hospitality. Your body is a site of hospitality. And we learn this through eating. Not just the eating that we do, but the eating that's going on inside of us by all these microorganisms and the eating of us being done by the microorganisms. So the line between guest and host is blurry, very, very blurry. And so one of the things we have to figure out is, given that our body is the site of hospitality, how are we going to position ourselves in the world? Well, I think one of the ways we do this is we look to God, because God is the one who creates as the action of hospitality. The whole of creation is one vast scene of hospitality. You're in it, whether you want to be or not. The question is, how are you going to be in it? Are you going to be a gracious host? Are you going to be the kind of host that witnesses to the hospitality that God shows and has shown from the beginning. I think churches really ought to take up this way of thinking about the world. The world is a place in which the giving and the receiving of life is happening all the time. And there are lots of ways we can do this. Think about what our bodily posture in the world might have to be if we're really going to be hospitable. A commodity logic trains us to come to the world like this because we come to grasp and take, right? If you serve the Eucharist and you see someone coming to you like this, (laughs) what are you thinking? Wrong posture. You're supposed to come like this. Why? We're receiving. But also, our hands are like this because upon receiving, what can we now do? We can go like this. We can share. We don't come and just take and then do that because that would suggest that we have forgotten it's a gift. Gifts are for sharing because God is the first one who shares. And so we have to learn about sharing. And it's no accident that the church decided that one of the primary ways we're going to learn about the sharing of life is this thing called the Eucharist where we eat Jesus as the bread of life And we drink Jesus as the cup of salvation. Do you remember the passage in John 6? It's an amazing passage. Jesus is with the disciples and thousands of people have appeared and they're on a hillside and they're being spoken to by Jesus. And then Jesus says, wait a minute, the people, they're all hungry. And Jesus says, we have to feed them. And the disciples say, well, we don't have any food. Let's go send them off to get some food. And Jesus says, are you kidding? That's not what a host does. And so Jesus says, we have to find some food. And guess who has some? It's a boy. What does the boy have? Yeah, fish and bread. Is it enough just for the boy? No, because this boy, I want to believe, had a really good mama said, when you go eat, you have enough to share. And Jesus builds upon this sharing mama and says, I'm going to show you about what sharing's like and takes the love communicated in the basket that went with that boy and now just multiplies that love because love grows in the sharing. Love is diminished only when you try to keep it for yourself. 
But if you open it up, it grows. So much so that everyone is fed and there are 12 baskets left over. We're told that after Jesus had fed all these people, they all rushed upon him and wanted to make him king. And you can understand why, because in a situation, a culture, a time, when most people know about hunger, to have someone as your king who can produce food on demand, sign me up for that God, Jesus the grocer. And then Jesus says, no, that's not who I am. He says, I'm not like God who then sent down the manna. Even that's not far enough to understand me. You have to understand me as the bread of life. And the Greek says, unless you eat me, you have no life in you. And the, the Greek verb here is tregain, which means not nibble, it's chomp, chew, masticate. Jesus says, you have to eat my body, my flesh, which is the bread of life. Now, you can imagine this is a rather repulsive way of speaking because it sounds like cannibalism. And we're told very clearly right off that this is a way of talking about abiding. Jesus abiding in us and we abiding in him. But the fact that Jesus makes this co-abiding so visceral in your gut is important because you can't just be transformed to become the kind of hospitable person that Jesus is by thinking about it. Jesus has to actually enter into you and become your food, your energy. So just as you eat this bread of life which becomes the nurture that transforms you from within, you also drink his blood, the power of life. It's like having a blood transfusion or a life transfusion so that the life you now live is the life that Jesus first models for us in his various ministries and that you then participate in when you make your life the sort of life that heals and nurtures and befriends others. In other words, Jesus became our food so that we can be food for the world. So the church uses this Eucharist, this utterly mundane action of eating some bread and drinking some wine and says this can be the place for transformation so that you can move into the hospitable postures that I've been showing you all along. We know that the temptation is to want to resist doing that we want to say that, well, I'll eat with these people, but maybe not these people. Because, you know, those people, a little weird. And this is happening in the early church. Think about Acts. Think about the story of Peter and Cornelius. Peter's a very good Jew because he knows you don't eat with Gentiles. But God says... If you don't eat with Gentiles, how will the gospel spread to the whole world? If Peter can't eat with Cornelius, there's no Christian church that you and I are a part of. It's a big deal. So God gives Peter a vision. And it's not done just once because God knows we're not very fast learners. And so God brings a sheet down from heaven. And on the sheet, what do you see? All the life, all the animal life. And God says to Peter, none of this is unclean. This is a very, very important thing to note because historically speaking, one of the ways you prevent people from getting into touch with each other, or even worse, marrying each other, is you don't let them eat together. Because when they eat together, they discover their co-humanity. And so the barriers that we would want to set up that say you are other, or you are alien, or you are foreign, stay away from me, 
that barrier breaks down when you start to eat with each other. And there are so many examples that I could give about how this is actually working itself out in our culture today. But in any event, God says to Peter, nothing is unclean. You have no excuse not to eat with Cornelius. And so God says to, Cornelius, or to Peter, you go to Cornelius and you eat with him. Hospitality, just hospitality that welcomes others because when we keep others away, not only do we create the problems that we associate with stereotypes, with oppression and violence, we are prevented from understanding better how God is at work in the whole world. So we start with the Eucharist. We extend hospitality by eating with each other. Sometimes pastors will come to me and say, I'm kind of bored. I think my congregation's bored too. And so I ask him, I say, how much do you eat together? I mean, really eat together. He said, well, you know, we're busy. So sometimes I'll suggest to them, what if you were to change the service? And instead of doing a sermon and reading three biblical passages and having the offering plate and all that stuff, what if you decided that you were simply going to come together and eat together, cook the food together, sit around tables, talk about each other's lives, punctuate it all with songs, with prayer, with scripture reading. So one pastor told me, I can't do that. And I said, why not? He said, because they'll blame me. I said, they, what do you mean they'll blame me? He said, they'll blame me for being bored. And I said, well, just think about it and let me know if you do it. Three months later, I get this phone call in my office, and the voice on the other end didn't say hello first. It just said, I did it. <laughs> and of course, I had no idea who this was. And I said, what did you do? And who are you? And he said, well, I'm that pastor from Ohio that met you, and I had talked to you about my boredom. And you said I should just sort of scrap a service and, and make it an eating fellowship. And I want to tell you, I did it. And I said, how was it? He said, I don't know why I waited 18 years to do this. He said, it's the most important thing I've done in all my years of ministry. It's not a big church. But he said what happened is, is we came together and we actually looked at each other, talked to each other, and we ask the question, why do we want to be together at all? Are we just going through the motions? And he says, the congregation said, we need to eat together regularly because we need to know what's going on in each other's lives. And so table fellowship, he said, has now become our number one priority. Because when we come into the presence of each other, we can see where the need is and where the possible help is. We learn where the struggles in our community are so that we can actually be a faithful witness and participant in the healing of our neighborhood. Don't underestimate table fellowship. Because table fellowship can be one of our entryways into what the life of hospitality might mean. Because if you ask me, I think our world absolutely craves genuine hospitality. My guess is that for many of you, one of the best moments in your life or several of the best moments of your life have food in them. Right? Why is that? It's because when we eat together, something deep happens. We look into each other's faces we learn to hear what's going on in each other's lives. We become more real with each other. Now, I know table fellowship can go terribly badly. So you have to build up to this. 
But when it goes well, it ends up in something like the Sabbath that we were hearing about this morning that Catherine talked about so beautifully. Sometimes the Sabbath is referred as, to as the eternal banquet. And there's a good reason why. It's because in this eternal banquet, we feast with each other, and a feast is about recognizing how precious the people around the table are and how precious the food is that you're eating. Sometimes I worry that we go through life so quickly, so oblivious to all that's going on around us, that what makes our lives not just tolerable, but perhaps convivial, passes us by. And so if you're thinking about what kind of Sabbath practice you might try to move into, think about eating together. It can be one of the best ways that you can live and experience something about life's potential and life's joy. Eucharist, eating together, church-supported agriculture. You've heard about community-supported agriculture, right? This idea that farmers partner with community members who pay up front so that the farmers know that they will have income because one of the most important questions every farmer faces is, will I get paid? So they often have to sign contracts at the start of the year with a seed company who will promise to buy, or they have to sign up a contract with the chicken provider who will promise to buy the product at the end of the season. Right? Because as you, I hope, know, farmers don't get a weekly paycheck. What if churches were to partner with farmers? and gardeners. Think about what that could do to agriculture in this world. Right now we know that there are a lot of farmers who are under intense pressure to raise animals, to grow fields that they don't want to do it that way. But they have no choice. What if churches said, we'll give you a choice. We commit to buy what you grow so that you can make a decent living. And in the meantime, we'll get really good food. We'll establish a relationship with you. We'll partner with you. We'll help assume the risk. I think our agricultural scene could be transformed if faith communities were to understand that this is absolutely crucial to the healing of our communities and the healing of our world because our soil is languishing, our water is languishing, animals are being abused, agricultural workers are being abused because the commodity logic is destroying them. Churches don't need to supply that or continue that commodity logic. We can partner with farmers in all sorts of creative ways. I don't know how you would do it exactly here because What's possible here might not be what's possible in North Carolina where I live. But as I travel around the country, I see church communities, faith communities taking this on more and more. And it's incredibly exciting. And it's a powerful, powerful witness to the world. Because how do you argue against a garden? Right? So many people have said, I thought church was a place of bickering backstabbing, xenophobic thoughts. But here I see a church that's growing food for the neighborhood, a church that's growing flowers, a church that is helping young people appreciate the importance of good, nutritious, healthy food, and you're teaching them how to do that. You're giving them valuable life skills. And then what if churches were to become more involved themselves where they are in the growing of food? Churches are some of the biggest landowners in the world. What's being done with a lot of the land that churches sit on? Would that be a witness to the world if churches were to transform, maybe not all, but some of their property to the production of fruit and flowers, vegetables, that could be a witness to the hospitable God who is constantly 
making room for others, welcoming them into God's own life, nurturing them so that they can experience life's fullness, life's abundance, which is what God wants for the world. I think this could be transformational. As I say, our world needs this. The question is whether or not the church is ready. An example, an example that I'll give you. Am I out of time? Five. I have five minutes. Uh, one of my very good friends is named, named Rob Webb. He works with church congregations across North Carolina. And he's worried about the churches that are dying. He says about, there's 1,900 or so in North Carolina, Methodist churches. And he says about 500 will die in the next few years. Probably more should die because the people are more about this being their church than about it being God's church. And he says these are congregations that have no connection to their neighborhood. It's about preserving some memory. But Rob is very intelligent about these sorts of things and believes that church ought to be the sort of place that by being in a community becomes a center for the community's revitalization, which means that churches are involved in the health of the community, literally the health, finding children who are suffering, right, trying to make medical help available to people who don't have access to it. He believes that churches could be catalysts for economic revitalization in communities because Churches are one of the few places left in our society where we've got folks from all different kinds of walks of life, different generations of people that come together at least ostensibly so that we can do good in the world. Why can't churches become sources of economic revitalization? Or think about how churches could be places where literacy is being done with our children because we know that literacy rates are declining so much so that the state in North Carolina has said, we want to partner with churches because when churches do a literacy program, it's so superior to the programs that we run through the state government. And the question is, well, why? And one reason is, they think, it's because when the kids come into a church, there are people there who say, welcome. You know the difference between being in an institutional setting and being in a community setting. There's love. And the kids respond, and they do so much better. So anyway, Rob is meeting with all sorts of food providers, distributors. You know, these are big people working in corporations and government sectors. And he had a meeting with them. He called them together, hundreds of them, to say, you all need to partner with churches because churches are actually the ground floor for many of the things that you're interested in, about sourcing, production, distribution, all that sort of stuff. And so all of these business people, government people involved in the food sector industry are saying, yes, let's go to churches. Then Rob goes to the churches and says, I've just had all these conversations with po folks who work in the food industry, and they want to partner with you so that the neighborhoods in which you serve can be food hubs so that the food deserts disappear, the food swamps disappear, and there's health associated with good food. And he said it was utterly demoralizing because so many of the pastors said, that's not part of the church's ministry. Jesus is in the food business. Churches should be in the food business. Because as the letter to the Galatians says, the good news gospel has been preached to every creature on earth. Think about the Christ hymn that happens there. All things come to be through Jesus. In him all things hold together. And through the blood of Christ's cross, God is reconciling all things in heaven and on earth to himself. All things, tapanta. What's so striking about the gospel is that when you read it, not just in terms of the New Testament, but also in terms of what the early Christian church believed about Jesus and the church, is that the vision went cosmic right from the start. We seem to have forgotten that. And I think Jesus is calling us back. <laughs> I did not plan that. 
Who did it? Who did it? Fabulous. Thank you. I owe you a quarter. <laughs>